Hello, I'm John Scott, the Purdue Extension Coordinator for Digital Agriculture with Purdue Extension and the Wabash Heartland Innovation Network, or WIN. Today's title uh, of this webinar is Making Sense of Your Sensors, and we're going to discuss in depth different sensors and, and sensor concepts. Uh, first of all, though, we're going to talk about just electrical, general electrical concepts and using a multimeter. And the reason that we're going to start off with this is that way you have the basic background knowledge of how to use a multimeter really to, to track bolts, which is something that Andrew's going to talk quite a bit about um, in his talk when he talks more about calibration, the importance of calibrating your sensors. So first off, the electrical concepts. Um, there's, there's two really two things I want to hit on here. The first one is current types. So mainly there's two types of current in, that, that we deal with. So we've got two types of current. We've got alternating current uh, or AC and we've got direct current or DC. So your alternating current is going to follow this type of a, a pattern. In the United States, that frequency of that, that sine wave is what this is, is about 60 hertz. Uh, whereas direct current doesn't have a, a sine wave. It's just a straight line and it flows you know, in this direction over time. Some examples of, of AC would be generators, turbines, the, the power on the power lines, uh, buildings, so any, any barn, house, what have you. Most of all of your appliances inside the houses that plug into the wall, those are all going to run on AC current or alternating current, AC power. Uh, DC, on the other hand, is really where we're going to focus most of our time. Those are batteries. Um, so most of your electronic devices that, that are battery powered, so your cell phones, laptop, wall clock, are going to run on DC. The batteries that, that provide the startup power for any piece of equipment that you use in the field or construction site or even your car was also going to be a DC power. So we're going to use a, a, a multimeter to track volts uh, pretty much through DC systems. The other thing I want to talk about is Ohm's law and, and that's really important especially for DC power. It, it portrays to both AC and DC but it really does a good job of explaining how DC power works. So Ohm's law states that current or amps, um, the flow if you will, through a conductor and the conductor in our case is usually wire. That's also the resistance component uh, between two points is directly proportional to voltage across the two points and voltage would then be your, your electrical potential or your pressure. So the formula for that was written as I equals V over R where I is amperes or amps, V is voltage and R is resistance. And it can also be written as if you wanted to change it and solve, instead of solving for amps, you want to solve for volts or for resistance, you could write that as V equals I times R or R equals V over I. Um, in which case, all the, the variables are the same, you just change up the, the way the equation works. And not all materials are going to obey this, this particular law. Those would be non-ohmetic materials. Um, things vary on that, but we're going to really focus on things that do obey, um, pretty much obey this law. So to break that down quickly, just a little bit, volts or V um, is the electrical unit, is the unit of electrical potential between two points. Um, this is commonly what you're going to track if you're troubleshooting a, search, a short circuit in a system. So what we're going to focus on today when we actually go out and show you how you would use a voltmeter or a, a multimeter to track volts. And it's what Andrew's going to talk about quite a bit when he talks about calibration, because we will be tracking volts through the system to make sure that that system is operating where it should be. Uh, amps or ampers <clears throat> is the unit of electrical current. So it's the movement, the flow of the electrical charge through the system. Ohms then is your resistance or this Greek letter omega stands for ohms and that's the unit for resistance. It quantifies an object's resistance to transmit electricity due to conductivity or size restraints. So those are the, the basic components. So the next part of this is going to talk about really strictly volts. And we're going to be looking at volts in DC more so than AC. The, the multimeters that we have can do both AC and DC. Um, but since we're talking sensors, sensors are primarily going to run on DC in any piece of equipment that we might have, which is usually we'll be troubleshooting any sensors. So we're going to look just at DC. We're going to look at some batteries. And then we're also going to look at a few sensors themselves. We're going to discuss multimeters. So here to the left, we've got two analog multimeters. We're going to be using this one uh, primarily. And here on the right side, we've got a, uh, a digital multimeter. Both of these multimeters, um, I just picked up at the, the local hardware store. They are 10 to, to 50 bucks, somewhere in there. Um, but some multimeters, especially professional grade ones, could run even up to uh, hundreds, 
to, to thousands of dollars. Most of the day, we're going to focus on the, the digital multimeter, but uh, I want to talk about the analog as well. These are the type of multimeters I learned on. My grandpa uh, showed me. And then more and more, uh, just for the ease of use, I've gone with this digital one. This is the one I primarily use here for, for electrical testing. So with that, what we're going to do is kind of take a look at these, these units, uh, specifically these two units. So all these multimeters, they're going to basically test uh, three things, potentially. So you've got your volts, your amps, and your ohms, or your resistance. Those are the, the three things they're going to test. They're also, uh, both of these can do DCV, which is direct current volts. We've got down here, we have ACV, so alternating current volts. This one can do direct current amps, in this case, milliamps. And then our ohms is, is right there. This digital one, it can do volts. And this is DC volts, so that symbol right there, the line with the three dashes, that's for DC, direct current. And then you have volts with the little squiggly or the tilde. That's uh, volts for AC current. This particular device can also do a battery. Here's amps for AC current and DC current. This is a, a setting for continuity, was that that uh, thing that kind of looks like a sideways Wi-Fi signal. And then your that's a diode there beside, right below it. And then right up here, that's testing for ohms. So omega, Greek letter omega stands for ohms. So that's, that's how this one works. Uh, diode, real quick, if you aren't familiar, those are diodes right there, uh, D3 and D4. Everything above it, those are actually resistors. So those are the, the, the main things that we're going to test. The other thing that we've got on these, if, if you'll notice, you have a, uh, here you've got a black and a red. So if we look close, the black says negative or calm. And then the reds plus, and you have the, the volts, ohms, and amps letters as well. So the black lead uh, would go to the common or the negative, and the red lead would go to the positive to make sure we have the right, the right circuit. Uh, same thing with this device. We've got our common right here in the middle. Um, in this particular case, we've got milliamps, microamps, volts, ohms, diode, and continuity. And then if we actually want to test amps themselves, we actually have to flip this device uh, or this terminal lead from this one to this one because that's a bigger fuse so that we can test amperage um, up to 10 amps. Whereas this one here won't go that high. If we, if we mess it up, uh, you could blow a fuse and, and render the device inoperable. What we're going to do first is test some battery just to kind of show how these devices work. So here's the, the batteries on this case crawler. Uh, you can see we've got the red and the positive and the, the black and the negative. We've got two batteries here and these are actually wired in series. Uh, you can tell that because back here we've got this, this cord that jumps across. So here's a positive to the negative and that runs across to this positive which then is a hooked back into the, the rest of the machine through, through this negative. So these two batteries are wired in series and that's why we have a, a 12 volt battery here and a, a 12 volt battery here. When we wire them batteries in series, we get a uh, additive effect, basically double the, the voltage, and that's what we're seeing here. We've got 24.1 volts, which is really what we would, we would expect to see um, in this machine with this particular configuration of battery. Now, if these batteries were wired in parallel, the, the, the voltage would be 12. Um, each of these would have 12, but the amperage would be roughly doubled in that case. Most of the time on, on most construction equipment, even farm equipment, if you have a, a two battery system, uh, it will be wired in series so that you, you bump up that voltage and actually you improve your cranking. Um, so that's what they, that's why they would do this to help give it that little bit of extra juice to get going. The last thing I'm going to discuss is this sensor right here, um, or this device, this is multiple sensors. So we've got a microcontroller here. This is an ESP8266. This is a sensor for temperature and humidity. You take a look at that. Um, this is an LED. And this is a sensor all the way over here. It's a moisture, sole moisture probe. This is a switch. It's this uh, relay switch that actually is protected on this side for the, the three volt. And it steps it up to the 12 volt needed for this pump. And that's all hooked up to this battery. This is a battery pack. That I just had on hand and I got to the Ag Tech, Forbes Ag Tech conference. So you've got your input and your output, 5 volts, 1,000 milliamps right there. 
hook that in to this microcontroller. So this is all powered through DC. Um, on this microcontroller, we have a couple of things. This right here, this VIN, that's got a 5 volt power supply. And then if we take a look right here, you can see where it says 3V3, so that's 3.3 volts. So we've got a couple of these 3V3s, and we've got this, this 5 volt as well. So we can take a look at that and see, with the, with the multimeter, and see, you know, are we getting the right power? What's going on with the power flow? So we're going to take a look at that. So here the device is powered up. We've got power there. We've got all the lights are on. If we look close, we can see the blue line there is the, at the, the 3V3, so we should have 3.3 volts. To the to the relay switch and then the green wire there's the ground so if we move over and we put the the red wire the red lead on the blue line and the black one on the green we've got ground and vcc so that should complete our circuit and give us 3.3 volts we come over here and look at the voltmeter it's already set up this is DC. Uh, we're at the 20 there at the bottom, and we are at 3.3, exactly like what we would expect given the power. So our power supply here is good in this case. The power to the sensor itself is, is exactly what we would anticipate seeing. Um, that's what we would want. The next thing to do then would be to you know, make sure that the sensor itself is, is calibrated so that we, we can make sure that whatever we're plotting as we're looking at changes over time in temperature in this case or humidity, especially with soil moisture, that we have the right measurements. Um, the only way to get that because of the bias in the sensor itself is to make sure you do the calibration, which Andrew will talk about next. In part two, we'll talk about how to take the output of a sensor to calibrated units. For example, temperature sensor to degrees Fahrenheit or a wind speed sensor to miles per hour. I'm Andrew Baumless, and without any further ado, let's get started. Unsurprisingly, the answer to this problem is calibration. And calibration is the procedure one goes through to teach a sensor system how to manipulate and scale the raw sensor readings into, the, into desired units. Most of you are likely familiar with these processes on the farm already, even if you find them annoying or slightly distracting from your real work. For example, many of you will at least calibrate the combine yield monitors right before and hopefully throughout the season, or you'll dial in your sprayer's rate. It's important to step to ensuring guidelines are followed and that good readings are available to make decisions with, and that's likely why you currently put up with it. But that brings me to maybe one of my most important take-home messages of the, of the day. While calibrated sensors are not only needed for day-to-day -day work, but they're also, in my opinion, one of the most important pieces, of, of, uh, pieces for success of big data in agriculture. If the data is not meaningful, then the corresponding algorithms that train and act on the data aren't meaningful either. In other words, sensors are great, but out of calibration, they're just expensive line makers and you don't need something else causing you problems. To see what we mean by sensor calibration and to see how one's done, we first need to remind ourselves of what a sensor is. So going back to last week's webinar, you might recall that the sensor is a device that converts some physical stimulus into a signal, like a voltage. Oftentimes, uh, there's a, included in that sensor system is a transducer that converts whatever the native output of the sensor is into a DC or a constant voltage. The transducer can be implemented as circuitry or even as software. By the way, it's not usually the, it's usually the sensor or the system's manufacturer's problem. And you can just mostly think of a system or as a sensor as a device that converts that stimulus into just a simple voltage. So now that we have this uh, relatively simple model of a sensor, what can we do with it? Well, we can measure the output with a voltmeter that John just talked about. It's not much different than what a real sensor system does. Excuse me, they use devices called analog to digital converters, or ADCs, which are essentially volt voltmeters for software. They convert uh, sensor voltage into a number that can be processed on. For this talk, we'll just imagine using or taking sensor measurements by hand, but it's really no different than what your fancy systems do. It's just that it's faster than you can do it, and it's a lot more convenient to let them do it for you too. But we have a voltage. We still don't know what the sensor value is. To sort of see how we go from voltage to sensor value, let's look through an example. We'll start with pressure sensors. 
This is kind of what an industrial pressure sensor looks like. It's got this threaded piece here that can screw right into the vessel that you're measuring. They're made out of piezo-resistive materials, and we'll just say that when the pressure changes, the resistance changes, and we can measure that as a voltage. So on our, on our experiment, we're going to have this thing we call a can of air, and we're going to attach one of these pressure, pressure sensors to it. You can think of this as like the tire in your car, and the pressure sensor is the monitoring system that tells you the, when you need to fill up your tire. But the problem is we still don't know how to interpret the pressure sensor. So to do a calibration, we're going to excuse me, we're also going to need a calibration standard. In this case, we're just going to use an analog gauge, but we'll use a good one, one that's a little bit more precise and a little bit more accurate than this pressure sensor is expected to be. We'll use this pressure gauge to, to as the truth, what the real pressure inside the container is, and then we can use that to calibrate the sensor, just like this. We hook a voltmeter to the sensor, we have our gauge attached, we put some air into the can, let's stop at 15 PSI, our sensor output is one volt. So we'll go ahead and just plot one volt and 15 PSI. We can add some more air up to 30 PSI. We've got two volts, 45 PSI gives us three volts, 60 PSI gives us four volts. And it's becoming pretty clear that this system is linear. In fact, it's probably this line right here because all those points go through it perfectly. And this line, knowing this line, means that we have calibrated the system. We have configured, we figured out the mapping from voltage to pressure. Line, uh, uh, the equation of a line, going back to grade school, is y equals mx plus b. It may, be a long, it may be a while since you've had to use that, and I promise you, you don't really need it here, but it's interesting to see how it maps. We've got y as our, y as our axis here, and that's volts, so we'll call it v. And that equals m. m is uh, the slope of the line, and that's the, one of the things we're trying to determine, so we'll leave it as a, a parameter. We multiply it by the x-axis, in this case it's pressure, or p, and then we have plus b, which really accounts for the fact that this sensor may not output zero volts when there's zero pressure inside the container or a vacuum. Turns out in this simple model it does. It happens across the origin, and so b is equal to zero, but a real sensor it might output zero volts at, say, one atmosphere. So when the pressure inside the container is equal to the pressure of the atmosphere or something like that. In that case, B wouldn't be zero. Um, but really what it comes down to is measuring M and B, and that's what we mean by calibration. So in this case, M, or the slope, is one over 15. Or what we mean by that is when we go up one volt, we also have to go over 15 PSI. And in this case, we can do that really repetitively or repeatably, and so that we know the slope is 1 15th. We see that the line goes through the origin, the sensor would read zero volts as a vacuum, and so we know B is zero. And using this, this relationship, we can now write down the equation, which a system would need to convert the pressure or the voltage into a pressure. And that relationship is that the voltage is equal to 1 15th of the pressure in PSI. And that's the, the key. This, this 1 15th maps voltage to PSI. We could have come up with a different slope that would map voltage to some other units for pressure, but we chose PSI here, and so we found that it's 1 15th. So in short, determining M and B, that's calibrating the sensor. Good news is most sensor systems do this for you. You just have to tell it what the measurements are so that it can find M and B. And so you might ask yourself, well, if it's just finding M and B, or whatever the coefficients of the, of the relationship for that particular sensor is, well, why can't we just do that once? Why can't the factory do it and just kind of hard code it in there? Well, there's a few good reasons. Actually, there's more than three, but we'll look at these three as the primary ones, and we'll look at them one at a time. First one is, there. there's also errors in the rest of your system. So, for example, this sensor here that's measuring uh, the pressure sensor, the ADC in your real system, or the voltmeter in your hand, it may not be perfect. So while this pressure sensor reads one volt, the, the meter might read 1.01 volts. And so as we uh, plot more data points using this non-perfect sensor system, we see that our measurements have a little bit of error and we now can't, don't get repeatable results. We get this little kind of clustering around the actual values. Additionally, your calibration standard may have error too that you should account for. Here we're shown as green dots. And, and it could be that our, our understanding of what the um, true measurement is, is a little bit off. I want to connect this back. You might, or you might think that that seems unlikely. This is a really accurate sensor. But think about, say, to calibrating your sprayer 
where you measured out how long it took to drive 1 20th of an acre at your speed, and then you put a bucket under the sprayer and you, and you held it there for the same amount of time. And then in the field, you kind of held it up and you looked at the bucket and you went, oh, I sprayed in gallons or you know whatever the units are. Well, did you hold it perfectly still? Were you looking at it right? Did you hold it on the sensor for exactly the right, or the sprayer for exactly the right length of time? There are a lot of ways that this sort of truth value could have some error in it, and we need to account for that as well. And so now we have these clusters, and we're showing here even another run where maybe you even have a significant error. This one here is where we tip the bucket a lot. How do we compute M when we have something like this? Well, good thing is math has an answer for us. It's not all that important for our discussion, but you still need to just fit the best line. You find the line that describes your data the best overall. It's not perfect for all of it, but it produces the, less expect, the least expected error. And there are lots of algorithms out there and lots of ways of sort of defining what that quote unquote error is. Least squares is a popular one. Again, this is something that your system will do. You don't need to worry about it. But I hope this imparts a little intuition, a little appreciation for why maybe sometimes a system asks you to follow the calibration procedure more than once. It may be trying to account for a lot of um, um, error or uh, 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 untrusted inputs in the system and, and then trying to work out what is really that best line so that you get an overall well perform good performance. Okay, the second issue is no two sensors are alike. Even one sensor might change. Maybe it's a temperature sensor and it was really cold and it basically uh, changed the sensor just slightly, but that change is permanent and the calibration is slightly altered. As an example of this, excuse me, we'll go ahead and take our, our normal system that we just looked at, but replace the pressure sensor with a new one. This could be the same sensor, the same model, I mean, run from the same factory, maybe even the same time there's still process variation. Those two sensors won't be perfectly equal to each other. And so if we plug in sensor two, which has a calibration or an M of 116, but we were to continue using our calibrated value from sensor one as 115th, then we'd have this consistently, all consistent, always there error that would plague our data set. In this case, we'd have a 6% error no matter what we did. The worst part about it is if we could get rid of that error, that error doesn't need to be there, if we had recalibrated our system once we entered the new sensor, we would have this error would be totally removed. And so that's another good take-home message. If you change a sensor, even if it's the same model, you have to recalibrate. I can assure you those two sensors won't be identical to each other. And finally, the third issue is that sensors, they, they're like children. They don't really behave well all the time. They kind of do what they're supposed to do, but sometimes they go a little bit crazy. Let's look about springs for a minute as an example. We can sort of use a spring to measure a mass. We do that by uh, measuring how much the spring compresses when we put that mass on it. And using Hooke's law and Newton's law, we can work out the relationship between what we call the spring constant or the spring's uh, ability to produce force based on compression. And we can work back out then, okay, well the mass must be this because uh, I put a certain mass on it and the spring produced or collapsed this much and then therefore the spring would produce uh, an X force and they have to be equal to each other. We don't really need the math here, but you can see how um, uh, the, this sort of compression of the spring can be used to measure the mass. Another way to think about it is if I have a spring and I compress it uh, to half its current size, then the, the spring is producing twice as much force. So if I have a spring and I put weight on it and it compresses to half its size, then you know that the new mass is twice as much as the old mass. So relationships like that can help you work out the mass. So we can build this sensor system where we have a spring and a, a, some sort of sensor that can measure the deflection. And um, the output voltage is a measure of the deflection, which of course we just showed is a measure of the force being applied on the spring. This is sort of a rough model for a strain gauge or a load cell or what we'll see in a few minutes as your yield sensor in a combine. And we can kind of run through some experiments where we, we plot the force against voltage. In this case, our force is sort of zeroed and a zero force is some sort of middle voltage, and that's because we want to be able to show compression and expansion of the spring, if we make the spring get taller. And uh, when the spring is expanded, it's negative force, and when it's compressed, it's positive force. And when it's compressed, the, the distance that the sense deflection sensor is measuring is less, and so the voltage goes down, 
and when the, the spring is stretched, the distance uh, is longer, and so the voltage goes up. So we should sort of expect a curve that kind of runs in this region. And as we work through some different example points, we can see that it is kind of following what we expect, but Hooke's law and spring theory tells us that this really should be linear, but it kind of looks like it's not. It's got a small little curve to it here. Similarly, we can fill the graph in by stretching it, and we can see, well, same thing. It's kind of linear in the middle region, but it's got this curve as you go up. So what happened? Is, is Hooke's law is broken? Is our understanding of springs broken? No, not really. The fact is that the spring is changing. As you uh, compress the spring, the spring starts touching itself, and that's causing bending and different forces, and the spring sort of changes. It's a new spring, a different spring when it's compressed, and it's got a different K value. And what we're seeing is that K value change. Similarly, as we stretch the spring, we're, we're, we're uh, deflecting and stretching the, 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 the spring members, and it's also becoming a new spring, and, and we're seeing the K value change. So the relationship is still linear. It's the K times the deflection. It's just that K is not a constant in this system. And we have to deal with that. We have this really nice supposedly linear sensor that's exhibiting all this nonlinear behavior. Well, one way we could do it is sort of best fit a curve to it. If we knew what this curve is, and we collected enough data, we could do something like this reasonably well. That will allow us to have one calibration that makes the sensor work over all regions. It's just, this is pretty complicated. It's often called a multi-point calibration, and um, it means we're collecting a lot of data. It usually translates into complicated and easy to get wrong calibration procedures. So often we actually just go back to best fit lines but we define the lines in certain regions of operations. For example, if we focus on just these middle points here, then we can see, well, those middle points, they really are kind of linear. And I can compute this green line that does a good job of explaining the data, but only from about this point to this point, or this whole green region. So as long as we're operating only within this region, this green model is gonna be fine. If we go outside of the region, we've got a problem. You might see this as an error code on your monitor or some sort of um, warning bell, or the system may not be able to detect that you've left the region, and that's where it can get really bad, where if I start operating in this region, the system is going to use this line to, to compute what the force is, yet it's going to um, really underestimate it because it should be using uh, this curve up here. So to solve that, we can estimate uh, uh, different lines for each different region. So if we're in this purple region, this is the line to use. And if we're in this yellow region, then this is the line to use. And this works great, but your system needs to understand these regions and where they are and which line to choose. Oftentimes, the systems aren't smart enough to know that. They're relying on you to recalibrate the system when it's needed. So as you move through these regions, you're going to stop and recalibrate so that it, it's using the correct line. So you need to know your regions and you need to know how your system works. You need to know if what, at what point you should stop and recalibrate. And you need to be able to determine if the error is high enough that a calibration is required. I just have some examples. Temperature sensors also have a lot of curvature to them. Soil moisture probes have a lot of curvature to them. This, nat this inherent nature of linear sensors becoming nonlinear because of changes in the physical properties of the sensor uh, is normal. It's something we have to deal with over and over and over again. I'd like to show you one last example, and it's your combine yield sensor. The way these things work is as the grain comes up the clean grain elevator and goes over the top, the paddle kind of throws the corn against the wall. But before it hits the wall and falls into the clean, the clean grain bin, it hits this force plate right here. That's this thing right here. And there's a spring in here and a spring sensor, just like we talked about, or you know, at least similar to what we talked about. And to use, it's trying to measure the force of the corn hitting it to estimate what the yield is. I like to show this video here to just sort of give you an idea of what these things look like. There's a lot of corn. It's moving really fast and it's hitting this plate. This is a very dynamic system. It's very likely that this sensor is not super linear. It's moving through lots of regions of operations. And then on top of that, the corn, as it's wet or dry, might change the region of operation even again. So for example, if we uh, calibrated our yield measure uh, yield sensor early in the season when the corn was wet and therefore the true mass was higher, we might be up here where the forces are, are a little bit larger and operating on this purple curve. And, and we, might, uh, we might actually estimate this purple line. And then as the season goes on and the corn dries, uh, 
and the true mass of the corn starts reducing for the same yield measurements, we might end up in this green region here, and uh, but we might still be using the purple region or the region, purple curve if we haven't recalibrated. It's sort of up to you to notice that it's time to change and recalibrate the monitor. So calibrate and calibrate often, but don't waste your time just by calibrating all the time. Try to take advantage of some natural opportunities to figure out that your sensor readings aren't quite right. For example, every once in a while, if your procedures will allow it, use only one combine to fill a particular semi. And then you can use the, the yield monitor's uh, yield rate, rate readings and compare that to the weight of the semi once it makes it to the elevator. You can, they can call you on the phone and say, hey, the weight was this. You look at your monitor and say, wow, we're really off. Our monitor uh, estimate is, is very off compared to the elevator estimate. And so it's time to recalibrate. The other thing I would say is consider when your regions of operations may have changed. The te you know the environment has changed a lot. You've put a new sensor in, or uh, definitely you're in much much drier corn than you were in the last time you, you recalibrated, or you're in very different yields. You're in a, you calibrated against a, a lower yielding field, and now you're in a really high yielding field, for example. And the other thing to do is make sure you track these calibrations using your, your Trello and your smartphone apps that we talked about in webinar series, the very first webinar series with um, Professor Buckmaster. It's really important metadata. Knowing when you recalibrate is going to be really important for the big data algorithms. And knowing how much your error was when you recalibrated can actually help us go back and fix some of the errors or at least help correct some of it. Um, you know, in the post-processing. And so it's really important. Metadata doesn't have a natural place to go right now. It's a great use of Trello on those smartphone apps. So my parting words are happy farming. Go out there and get your stuff calibrated. If you have any questions, I'd be really happy to take them now.